Good morning. Uh, I would say take your hymnals, but you don't have any, but you can take your eyes. Yeah, we'll look at this. Oh, they do? Oh, you have? Oh, man, y'all slipped them in on me. I didn't know that. I did notice we have them back there, but I didn't put two and two together. So, you can take your hymnal and turn to page 100. Page 100, day by day. This is a nice little song here. And uh, as always, uh, a lot of times I'll tell you, please pay attention to the words that we're singing. They really can minister to you. Let's stand as we sing. Y'all sing out. Good to see all y'all this morning. Beautiful day. Let's stand as we sing. Day by day.
message of the morning, so I'm looking forward to that. That's next next Sunday morning. Um, a couple of things very quickly. We will be starting, <clears throat> and I don't know what I did with my bulletin, but I think I can remember. We'll be starting our Sunday night services uh, next Sunday, uh, starting them up back once again, as well as uh, Sunday school for all age groups and uh, the nursery downstairs. So that will all start back up next uh, next Sunday night and well Sunday morning and, and uh, Sunday night uh, we'll be having our services again as usual. Um, we'll give you further word. We're still looking to get further feedback on the Iwana ministry of the Good News Club, how that will be conducted this, this year. So we'll be forthcoming with more information on that. And then ladies, don't forget about Women in Christ uh, this Tuesday night. You'll be meeting here in person, and that's going to begin uh, again Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. So starting that up once again, look forward to having you here. Cindy, you got some family or some, some folks here with you today. Yeah, my grandchildren, Andrew, Abby, Aaron, and Ashley. Okay, good to have y'all uh, with us. I think I recognize the guy in the middle, right? Oh, he's the oldest. He looks a little like him, but are they brothers? Yes. Okay, well, that explains it. Yeah, Aiden's the one I remember. Yeah, we go way back. I remember when he was knee high, you know, but he's a grown man now. Um, Charlotte McDonald had written a little note to the church, uh, the family. Uh, acknowledges with grateful appreciation the kind expression of your sympathy on the recent ho home going of her husband John and she just writes saw the wonderful people from Calvary Baptist Church thank you for all you did uh, particularly the uh, fellowship meal after the service she writes you brought chips rolls napkins utensils chocolate cake and cookies we appreciate it all bless you all Charlotte McDonald and family well, I think that'll do it for all the announcements uh, today. So, Brother Gary, if you would, come back and lead us once again. All right, we've got another great song. Let's turn to it. Hymn number 243. Hymn number two, uh, 243, if we can. We've got a, this song's got to move. Victory in Jesus. This stand, we'll do all three verses. Y'all sing out.
I just wanted to, for you teachers, and uh, I think the youth has been doing the same, been doing the, what do you call it, virtual, that what's called virtual, you do it on a computer, right? It's virtual reality. I don't know how to say it. But uh, this song in particular reminded me of uh, Sheila and Miss Tammy's uh, Sunday school lesson this week. They talk about what things will be like in heaven and uh, streets of gold, pure gold, and walls of jasper and, and, and precious gems. I thank the Lord for you, uh, teachers and uh, youth directors and all this, kept the ministries going on, online and your faithfulness in doing so. I told Tammy, I love listening to those lessons, and if you missed it this week, uh, Miss Linda was a part of that. Linda did a great job. What was the character's name? Huh? Millie. Millie, Millie. I love Millie. She, I told Tammy, I wish she could be a kid again, so I'd come to y'all's class. But uh, thank y'all so much for ministering to us online. I appreciate it. We have a, uh, Meg's going to sing a song for us now.
song ministered to my heart this morning because I am resting my full weight on the grace of God today. We know with the grace of God how it's defined in regard to salvation, but once we're saved, grace is a reference to supernatural help. And uh, God has helped me so many times before. I stand before you this morning as a weak man. And Paul had his, his moments of weakness himself, but he rejoiced in his weakness because he found his sufficiency in God. And... Uh, you know, sometimes when we can't perform to the best of our ability, God more than compensates. And I've had to depend upon him for that many times in my life. Um, I have to offer up another one of those disclaimers that I'm becoming more famous for. I have got uh, some real problems with my ear today and uh, dizziness, lightheadedness, brain fog. Uh, I don't know uh, how this sermon's going to come out today, but I am leaning upon the Lord. Uh, so yesterday and today have been kind of rough. But, uh, and continue to pray if you would. I've got a, another uh, appointment with a cardiologist uh, this Tuesday and a neurologist on September the 24th. Just trying to find out what little nagging problem I may have. I want to talk to you for the next few weeks about a ministry that makes a difference for here and hereafter. If you think that would be something of interest to you. Amen. A ministry that makes a difference for here and hereafter. Um, and by the way, I probably have to stick fairly closely to my notes this morning since my mind is not working too well, so I apologize for that. Uh, maybe the Lord will cut me loose here in a minute. I don't know. I just have to see, see what happens. But I want to ask you something. Have you ever stopped to think of uh, what one thing in life is most rewarding to you? What one thing in life is most rewarding to you? How many of you can answer that question right away without thinking about it because you've thought much about it before? Because I know without a doubt the one thing that is most rewarding to me, and that is making a meaningful, eternal difference in the life of someone else. That's why I'm in the ministry. That is my passion. And if you share my sentiment, then you should find the next few messages hopefully very profitable to you. And so I've got some major categories we're going to be looking at in this series that all of the verses in the scriptures are taken from the Gospels. As I've been meditating upon those scriptures as of late, uh, again, taken from the Gospels and, for the most part, from the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what better to learn about the ministry than learning it from a master? And so I want to talk uh, today and the next couple of Sundays about the qualities that enable our ministry to have its greatest impact. And the first item on the list is this, a Christ-like testimony. Now please, I hope you take this stuff deeply to heart. The first thing that we need to have a powerful church for the glory of God and to do the work of God is a Christ-like testimony. And when you go home today, I'd like for you to just take the time to think about those major points a little bit. Give it some serious consideration. I take the, my text from Matthew 5, 13, where Jesus said, You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and, and to be trodden under foot of men. Very familiar text to all of you, I'm sure. When Jesus said this, he provided us with an expression which has become the greatest compliment that can be paid to anyone when we wish to stress someone's solid worth and usefulness we say uh, people like this are the uh, salt of the earth and it kind of comes from this text here that idea 
In the time of Jesus, Saul was connected in people's minds uh, with three special qualities. First of all, salt was connected with the idea of purity, and no doubt its glistening whiteness made the connection very easy to make. Uh, the Romans said that salt was the purest of all things because it came from the purest of all things, the sun and the sea. Salt was indeed the most primitive of all offerings to the gods of that day, uh, but even the Jewish sacrifices as well, if you recall, were offered with salt. That's significant. So if the Christians are to be the salt of the earth, they must be examples of purity. And one of the characteristics of the world in which we live in today is a lowering of standards, standards of honesty, standards of diligence and work, standards of conscientiousness. There is a decline in moral standards, uh, and uh, they're being lowered all around the world today. So the Christian must be a person who holds aloft the standard of absolute purity, purity in speech, purity in conduct, purity in thought. As James wrote in James chapter 1, verse 27, he said, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Are you unspotted today? Are you pure? Secondly, in the ancient world, salt was the most common of all preservatives. It was used to, to keep things from going bad and to hold uh, putrefaction at, at bay. A Plutarch, the, the uh, Roman historian and philosopher, has a strange way of putting this idea across. This is what he said. He said that meat is a dead body and part of a dead body and will, if left to itself, go bad. But salt preserves it and keeps it fresh and is therefore like a new soul inserted into a dead body. So salt preserves from corruption. And if Christians are to be the salt of the earth, they must have a certain antiseptic influence in their lives. So we do, do we have that going for us in our testimony today? But the greatest and the most obvious quality of salt is that salt lends flavor to things. Uh, Christianity is to life what salt is to food. Christianity, think about this folks, Christianity lends flavor to life. Christianity makes life taste good, does it not? And if there's something wrong with your taste or there may be something wrong with your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I'll tell you what, man, knowing Jesus Christ definitely for me has made life taste good. The tragedy is, is that so often people have connected Christianity with precisely the opposite. You try to witness to people, you know why many of them don't want to listen. They're so concerned about if they do get saved, they're thinking about all the things they're going to have to give up. And they don't think that Christianity could possibly taste that good. But let me tell you what, what I gained in Christ is far more benefit tastes so much better than what I gave up when I gave up the world in sin. And, the, and maybe the reason why the world feels that way is because maybe the testimony of the rank and file Christian is not compelling enough. It's not salty enough. They've connected Christianity with that which takes the flavor out of life. It's kind of interesting, the American judge, Oliver Wendell Holmes, once said, 
I might have entered the ministry of certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. Robert Louis Stevenson once entered into his diary as if he was recording an extraordinary phenomenon. He said, I have been to church today and am not depressed. Now see, this is the view, the perspective of many people in the world today. And let me tell you folks, there's nothing that's boring about Jesus Christ, but I wonder if there's something that's boring about us because our testimony <clears throat> is not salty enough. I wonder if there's something about our testimony that does not compel people to take a honest, hard look at Jesus Christ and the claims of the gospel. We need that Christ-like testimony. We are meant to be the salt of the earth, and if we do not bring uh, to life the purity, the antiseptic power, the radiance that we ought, then we invite disaster to fill the void. I guess it's easy to criticize folks, but I sometimes wonder about what kind of a job the people of God are doing today in these United States. I wonder if the reason for uh, so many corrupt politicians being in office right now, and by the way, they're there because the American people put them there. So, I understand about being positive and talking about the goodness of the American people, but there is at least half of this country that are voting for people that are absolutely corrupt. And, and you know what I'm talking about. So what is it in the thinking of the American people? What's gone wrong? Maybe the problem is not so much with them, but maybe it's with us and our testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe it's not salty enough. Maybe it's not compelling enough. And I think we've got to give more serious thought to this particular matter. I suppose I should, I should say something about that phrase uh, before us there, verse 13, that says that the salt have lost his savor. And to lose savor literally means to become foolish, that is, tasteless or insipid. And I'm sure the phrase seems strange to us because, I mean, pure salt as we know it today cannot lose its savor. However, here salt is referring to, in the context of the day, it's referring to dead sea salt that was obtained by merely evaporating some water. And uh, the resultant salt was impure and with time would become nothing but a worthless, unusable residue. And so God wanted to remind us of how important it is that we do not become worthless and that we do not become useless to him and to others. I think that's one of the reasons why Leviticus chapter 2 verse 13 Call for Old Testament sacrifices to be seasoned with salt. God was constantly putting illustrations of his desires and truth before the eyes of the Jewish people in the Old Testament. Uh, for instance, when he wanted to illustrate his strong desire to have his people separated from the people of the world, he forbid that they plow with an ox and an ass together. Separation. Uh, your garments had to be made of a pure material. It could not be a composite of two or three different kinds of materials. Because God wanted to illustrate the need for his people and, and for the, the need for fidelity and, and purity. And here he requires that the sacrifices be offered with salt. Uh, Leviticus 2.13, And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering, and all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. It's interesting, isn't it? All of them. The 
There's something else we need to know about the use of salt as a, as a metaphor. The salt was mixed in into the sacrifices not merely as a flavor and preservative, but as a symbol of the strength and the truthfulness of the people's self-surrender as they declared their loyalty, their dependence upon God, and their willingness to serve Him. <clears throat> the savor of saltiness that Jesus had in mind here, which is revealed, by the way, by its connection to the Beatitudes that directly precede this verse. Jesus expresses his desire for uh, us to have strong spiritual desires in our lives, to have a, a sorrow over sin, to have a, a, an unassuming gentleness to us, a desire for righteousness, a cheerful compassion, for heart purity, and the promotion of the peace with God. Jesus also showed believers uh, show the believers of salt when they take up their full cross, uh, take up their cross in full dedication to the Lord. Listen to Luke chapter 14, verses 26 to 34. And this to me is one of the toughest passages in Scripture. It's very demanding. And I think it's so demanding that there is a great number of believers that do not submit to it. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now he's not saying you ought to hate your family. That's figurative language. I mean, by comparison, our love for him should so be so much greater than it is for our family. You see, this is something that we have a difficult time comprehending. I mean, because mothers have that natural instinctive love for their children. And dads love their children too, but there's a, boy, there's a special connection between mother and child. And Jesus says, you know what? If you don't love me more than that connection to your child, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Is that not difficult? Is that not the reason why many people do not submit to Christ as a disciple? Because it costs much to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus never tried to hide that fact from anyone. So if any man come after me, come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost? Whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that shall, be, shall behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sitteth an embassage, and uh, or an ambassage and desireth conditions of, of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be, of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? You see, folks, that salt talks about an unreserved, all-out, full-time commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And how many of us have it? Because, see, 
that probably is the problem, the major problem of America today. Too few of God's people have enough salt in their testimony. And as I mentioned to you before, I'll say it again, whatever it's worth, whatever I'm preaching to you, God has preached to me first. This is the bottom line. If you're still with me. Our testimony should be one of unquestioned loyalty to God and a purifying force in the lives of others. That's what ministry is all about. Is your loyalty to God unquestioned? Do you have a purifying effect on the lives of other people? I want you to notice before I leave Luke 14, though, what the text just said. The three major points that need to be made. First of all, our relationship with Christ must take preeminence over all other relationships, including family. This is not up for debate. Jesus flat out said, I need to be number one. I need to be your first love. I don't want to be your second. I don't want to be your third. I don't want to be somewhere down the line. I need to be your number one love. The second thing he brings out in Luke chapter 14 is that you must be willing to sacrifice and suffer when maintaining your testimony for Christ if it's required. Third thing, you must first count the cost to follow Jesus Christ before you commit to following him. That's a very important principle. You must count the cost before you commit. There can be no second guessing your commitment to Christ when adversity comes, and it will come. And once you enlist in the armed forces, returning home when the bullets begin to fly is not an option, and once a commitment to serve Christ is made. Quitting is not allowed. You may have to forsake all to remain faithful to Christ. So do you and I love Christ enough? And do you and I have it within ourselves to go all in to follow him? Because until we do, we will never be the salty saints, and the purifying force in the lives of others that Jesus wants us to be. Have I made any sense so far? Y'all agree with what we just shared here? Amen. You would, hopefully the preaching was in line with the text, and certainly you would, you're wise enough not to disagree with Jesus, right? <laughs> and he talks about the need to be salty. The second point of this morning, and it's the last one we'll have time to cover. If you want to have a, a ministry that makes a difference for here and hereafter, then let me ask you something. Do you have a willingness to go beyond what is expected of you? First of all, you need to have a Christ-like attitude. Secondly, a willingness to go beyond what is expected of you. And I want you to go to Matthew chapter 5 for that, verses 38 and 42. Matthew 5, verses 38 and 42. We want to look at these five verses very quickly. Verse 38. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, by the way, I won't tell you right away, but when I get through these verses, there's something in common that ties all these verses together. And it's important for us to see it. But you've heard it, it's been said, you know, in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And uh, you see that in Exodus, you see it in Leviticus, you see it in Deuteronomy. And this was, uh, that 
that statement, that item of law, was both a, com a, a command to punish injustice, but a limit limitation on punishment. In other words, the penalty must not exceed the crime, <clears throat> is the idea. However, according to the, to the Old Testament, authority for punishment was vested in the government and not in the individual. So we need to understand that first. Then we go to verse 39, and he says, But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So Jesus went beyond the law to a higher righteousness by abolishing retaliation altogether. Now, he's not doing away with justice, but let me, let me just explain further what's going on here. He showed his disciples that whereas revenge was once legally permissible, if carried through by the government, he's now saying that non-resistance was graciously possible. Non-resistance was graciously possible. Jesus, therefore instructed his followers to offer no resistance to an evil person. If they were slapped on one cheek by someone, they were to turn the other to him also. Now the idea is not that we must always passively suffer the, the assault of the assassin or the bully or the chief. However, when the interest of, of Christ's kingdom demand that we turn the other cheek, that we should, is what Jesus is saying. If it will further your testimony, if it will open the eyes of the unsaved by your response, the fact that you don't respond like they expect you to, you respond in a radical, totally different way. You respond like Jesus Christ, who was a lamb, led to the slaughter. And that was unjust, it was unfair, it was undeserved. But Jesus didn't fight back. And that's why Jesus, that's one of the many reasons why Jesus continues to have such a tremendous impact on this world today. It's the way he, it's not just the way he died, but it was the way he lived his life while he was among us. Missionaries some time ago brought uh, the gospel to cannibals in Africa in the 19th century. Uh, some missionaries, such as Bishop Hamilton, were eaten. His two sons, a little bit later, went to Uganda to replace him and some other missionaries that had been killed. Eventually, they baptized and gave communion to men who had digested their own father's flesh. The new Christians... The former cannibals told the sons that the bishop, while being led to his death, repeatedly, unceasingly, uh, repeated unceasingly Jesus' words, love your enemies, love your enemies, love your enemies. And that made an impression upon these folks. I was reading about a pastor in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who recently had the opportunity to practice what he preached about forgiveness. The pastor was preaching when a man came up in the service and punched him in the face. <laughs> now I'm on the lookout to see if anybody's moving out of the pew right now. <laughs> Daniel, don't move. Stay right where you are. I saw that. But, uh, Punched him right in the face. So uh, the Victory Christian Center's pastor, Billy Joe Doherty, continued his ser sermon even though the blow had opened up a cut above his eye that would later require two stitches to close up. Church members subdued the attacker and police arrested Steve Rogers, who was uh, 50 years of age. The pastor Doherty prayed for his assailant during the church service and decline to press charges. You see, that's the kind of attitude that Christ wants from us. 
if it will further his cause. And don't you think that Stephen Rogers remembered that? I mean, what he did was uncalled for. It was brutal, and yet the pastor never pressed charges but rather prayed for the man. That's what the testimony of Christ is all about. And that's what it means when you're willing to go beyond what's expected. If somebody hit me in the face, what is expected is for me to take a swing back at them. But uh, that's not the, the path that Pastor Doherty took. Verse 40, and if any man will sue thee at, at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. There's more to this than meets the eye. It deserves a little bit of study. I mean, it's kind of interesting what you find. If a follower were sued for their tunic, which was the inner garment that's being talked about here, if uh, any man sue thee at law and take away thy coat or tunic, let him have thy cloak also. But the tunic was actually an inner garment and uh, so they were expected, if they lost their case in course, to give up the tunic, the inner garment. But Jesus said, I want you to go a step farther. I want you to go beyond what is expected. If they sue you for your tunic, give them your cloak also, which is the outer garment that, they were, that the Jews used to cover themselves up at night. It was almost like a blanket. Very important to them. In fact, according to Mosaic law, there was no law that could force a man to give up that coat, that cloak, or outer garment. However, it could be used as bail if the man didn't need the coat at the time, or the cloak. So this cloak, this outer garment, well, it was a staple of the Jewish population, and in clement weather, it was critical that they had it. And yet Jesus said, if a man takes you to court and sues you for the inner garment, give him the cloak also. Even though the law doesn't require it, go beyond what is expected. And that is a beautiful segue into the next verse, verse 41. Because I mean... What Jesus is trying to teach is coming into tighter view here. And whosoever shall compel, compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, or two miles. You, if an official compelled them to carry his baggage for one mile, they were to volunteer. Uh, they were to voluntarily uh, carry it two miles. You know, in the Lord's day, the Romans had the right to press both men and beast into compulsory service when the interest of the government required it. Case in point, uh, Simon the Cyrenian uh, was seized by the Romans, pressed into service when he was asked to carry the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was compelled to do so. And I'm sure Simon probably was nevertheless glad to do so, but the Romans required it of him. Let me tell you something about the Jewish people. They greatly resented this kind of compulsory service. It really went against their grain. They didn't like being in servitude to anybody. They didn't feel like as God's people that they ought to be in servitude to anybody. And that's why when Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem a week before his death, they thought he was coming to take his position as king, not as someone who, who was going to die. And they expected Jesus to set up his kingdom right away. They thought when he came in through the eastern gate, he'd take a right turn to Herod's temple and clear out the place, but he'd take a, he took a left turn to Gogotha instead, ultimately. So they resented it. But the Lord taught that it's our duty to help those who rule over us and to do it cheerfully. 
and to go beyond the call of duty. And when people impose upon us we're to go the second mile, it should be noted that the spirit of the age, look around and listen to the news today, it is quite different from what Jesus is teaching here. <clears throat> Probably many of you have heard of the uh, financial consultant, Christian financial consultant and author Larry Burkett. You heard that name? Um, I, I was familiar with him, I mean, going years back. I used to be securities licensed and uh, sold securities and things like that, investments. And so uh, Larry Paquette was very prominent in Christian circles uh, as a financial advisor. But in his uh, book, which was entitled Business by the Book, he talked about going the extra mile. In 1884, he leased an office in a building that proved to be a nightmare. I mean, the foundation of this building was sinking uh, about three to four inches a year. That's pretty serious stuff. And, uh, you know, it hadn't been properly constructed. And the office building was literally, uh, like I say, sinking. And uh, Larry Burkett, for more than three years, to put up with not only that problem, but other problems as well, including power failures and several weeks without water. And Burkett moved his business to another location. And don't you know that two months later, Burkett received a call from his former landlord who demanded that Burkett remodel and repaint his former office space. Burkett said no. He felt that he'd already done more than was, he thought that he'd already been more than fair with the landlord, but the former landlord continued to call with his demands. So Burkett consulted an attorney who agreed with Burkett and fulfilled his response. He agreed that Burkett had fulfilled his responsibility. So uh, he told him, he said, you shouldn't do anything. But Burkett writes this, he goes on to write in his book, he said, the Lord used my oldest son to offer me some counsel. He reminded me that the man and his wife had lost their only child a few years earlier and still suffered from that tragedy. We had often commented that we would like to help them. My son suggested that this might be an opportunity to go that extra mile, the Lord suggested. As I considered that, I had to agree with this conclusion. We decided to commit several thousand dollars to restore a virtually unusual, uh, unusable building. I guess the question is, does that make sense to us? Because it makes sense to Christ. Going the extra mile, going beyond what is expected. Going the extra mile oftentimes does not make good business sense, but it makes good spiritual sense. And then verse 30, 30, uh, 42, Jesus' last command in this paragraph seems the most impractical to us today. It reads like this, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. y'all won't force me to practice what I preach as soon as the sermon is over today and come asking for money and everything. We're just, we're just poor, humble people. You know? I, I, I promise not to come and hit you up for money if you promise not to come and hit me up for money, all right? I mean, but look at what it says. I mean, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee turn not thou away. Jesus' statement presupposes that the person who asks for help has a genuine need. But since it's impossible to know whether the need is legitimate in all cases, I found it interesting what man, what one man wrote that I was reading. He said this, uh, it is better to help a score of fraudulent beggars than to risk turning away one man in real need. 
that was good for me to read. I, I got to tell you, folks, I mean, as a pastor, you get so many calls. Uh, every week, people needing help for this, help for that. Um, you used to have people actually come to the church a lot and when they would continue to come, I began to see that their stories were fraudulent. They were not willing to help themselves, not always felt like, you know, you can't help somebody that doesn't want to help themselves. But if there's any doubt, I think we need to be open to helping those that come to us. And there have been many times, and I've relied upon the Lord's leading at the time, if this is legitimate, I, I need to open up and, and uh, see if I can help these folks in need. It's a very difficult thing at times. Because you and I both know there, there are cons out there that are just out to rip you off. But Jesus said, you know what? If there's some doubt, help them anyway. And in fact, they may be a con, but if you help them, it may open up the door for you to witness to them about Christ. That is not a lost opportunity and not a waste of money. You say, well, they're so used to con that they won't receive the gospel seriously. How do you know that? God promised his word would not return void. Paul said the gospel is like dynamite. Give it out and leave the results with God. But go the extra mile. Uh, you know what? This is the thing. There's several things that these verses have in common. First of all, it's only a person that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that can actually live the, the self-sacrificing life that Jesus is asking us to do here. And only as the Savior is allowed to live his life and the believer can insult, as we see in verse 39, injustice in verse 40, inconvenience in verse 41. It's only then that these things can be repaid with love. This is the gospel of the second mile and why is a willingness to go beyond what is expected so effective in the ministry. It is because it opens the door to a person's heart. Remember the passage that we looked at just last week, and I'm almost done. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also. On the things of others. This is what I want to leave with you today. And I've stumbled my way through the message. I understand that. But please hear what I'm about to say. When you consider the environment that we live in today. If someone were to mistreat you or demand the unreasonable from you. He or she would expect a fight or a protest or a complaint about how personal rights have been violated. They would expect that from you. But if you were to respond as a lamb instead of a lion, then you might just make an impression for the cause of Christ and that individual may not soon, if ever, forget. You see the passage in Matthew 5, verses 38, through 42, if you stop and think about it, it's all about how you respond to those that care much more about themselves than they do about you. And it's to that crowd we're to go the extra mile. Are you up to it? So this is the point. If you want the opportunity to have a ministry that will make a difference, then you must respond, and I must respond to every situation 
the same way Christ would. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Dear Father, I pray that you would take the word of God this morning and use it to the benefit of the saints here today. And I pray that you would use us and cultivate us and develop us into those disciples that could have an eternal difference in the lives of other people. Lord, move upon us today to move out for you. And I, I pray, Father, that if we have left our first love, the Lord Jesus Christ, we would return to that love today. I ask in Christ's name, amen. In just a moment, we'll sing, we'll stand and sing. In number 306, have thine own way. If God has spoken to you in some way through the message and you would like to come and meet with God in prayer, uh, the, the altar is open up here. Please come. If you need to be saved, I'd be glad to talk to you about that on a personal level. If you were to die today and you're not sure where you'd go to spend eternity, it's really something you need to settle right away. Amen. As turbulent as this world is becoming, I mean, who knows, but Jesus could come back tomorrow. Are you ready to meet him? If not coming, let me help you with that. Let's stand up and sing the first stanza. Lord, have thy own way. two passages of scripture that I shared with you from the word of God that they would make a, a deeper impression upon your heart and, and mind. God bless you as you go. Brother Tim Woodring, would you close the prayer today, sir? Heavenly Father, oh, what an honor it is to be you called your child because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit who enters every believer to give us direction to live for you. Oh, Lord, I just pray that we will put ourselves aside and realize we need to put on you. Yes. Oh, Lord, people need to see Jesus Christ in us. Amen. Lord, Amen. people, when they see us live, they would have a desire to come to know you because of our conduct. And I just pray, Lord, that you will help us to live such a life that you will be glorified in us. Thank you so much for Pastor Rick and the message this morning. Oh, Lord, it is powerful. The word of God is true. And, Lord, it, it's, other men's opinion doesn't matter. It's what the word of God says. Yes. And I pray, Lord, that you will be magnified in each one of our lives. Yes. I pray that our neighbors, our family, will want to come to know Christ because of our love for you, dear mm -hmm. Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.